Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this 106 CPR uh, CSH Urban Workshop. We have the pleasure today to welcome Dr. Shana Shataraj. Uh, Shana, you are uh, you hold a PhD uh, from Princeton University. You are currently affiliated at uh, CPR, where you are writing a, a book comparing Shanghai and Mumbai. Uh, so, thank you for participating this uh, this workshop. Traditionally, you have between 45 minutes to one hour, but we won't be angry if you go ahead. And uh, then we'll take a round of questions, which can last uh, quite a lot of time as well. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Um, it's a real honor to be at the um, at the CPR CSH workshop. Um, um, almost a decade ago, I presented my very initial uh, some Mumbai work uh, at CPR when I was actually starting off my PhD field work. So it's kind of nice to present here again. Um, today I'll be presenting a, uh, a conceptual paper, um, an empirically grounded concept that tries to encapsulate how states govern cities which are um, largely informal, so cities like Mumbai. So this, um, the talk is going to be organized around this question of how does the state govern a city where informality in the economy and built environment is pervasive. And this is true of most Indian cities and a lot of cities in the developing world. And informality, um, as I'll argue here, presents particular um, challenges to uh, the operation of kind of bureaucratic states. Um, so the, the talk is going to be organized. I'll begin with um, um, a little bit of a ba background on the larger project and the genesis of this research. Um, then I'll go into um, the, the concept of, of the Jagard state and the relationship between the state and the informal economy. Um, and I'll interview, it's, it's largely a conceptual paper, but the con concept is based on, on my own empirical work over a relatively large period of time in Mumbai across different domains and sectors of state activity, um, as well as other research. Um, and I think you know many of the examples will be very familiar to anyone who's actually kind of lived in, Mum in, in any Indian city. Um, and I'll conclude with some, with some of the implications of this concept, some of the questions it raises for further empirical research. Um, and also some thoughts as to why we need new theories and concepts um, for urban India, but also really um, to better understand contemporary global urbanism. Um, so this paper is part of a, a, a kind of larger research project which began with my um, dissertation research. Um, and that has been kind of extended and developed further um, and is now going to take, uh, now um, going to be a, a book that should hopefully be out in a year, which is called Shanghai Dreams, State Power um, and Politics in the Project to Transform Mumbai. Um, and it's a sort of a comparative study in the sense that Shanghai is kind of a model and a lens. Um, and, um, you know, and, and you see that quote from Manmohan Singh, uh, there was this Mumbai transformation project that wanted to kind of follow Shanghai's uh, model of kind of very rapid planned transformation uh, led by the state to transform it into a world-class city um, and a globally competitive city. And um, I studied this not because I think Mumbai should become like Shanghai or a world-class city, um, but because it gave me an opportunity to kind of study how state power works and how the state as a whole governs um, a kind of metropolitan city in Mumbai. And this is something that still remains understudied in India. So a lot of the literature on urban politics and governance and political economy, um, you know, of how state power actually works is rooted in um, Western cities and Western experience. Um, so, you know, you have, uh, there's a very, you have kind of classic debates around uh, which groups have influence on um, how the state works. So, Dahl, Robert Dahl wrote this very classic book called um, Who Governs about New Haven, about which groups. And 
you know, the, so these are the kinds of questions that we look at when we're studying urban governance and who governs. And, and in India, that, even in a literal sense, um, is quite hard to establish. Um, and um, then how, which is what the idea of the Jugar state looks at, is how, how, it's, how the city is governed. And then, um, you know, to what effect and that what, is, what are the outcomes of various um, uh, policies, power distributions. Um, so the, you know, my methods um, quite appropriately, I suppose, ended up being a bit Jugar. Um, based, uh, you know, on kind of very large gaps in the literature and also um, my own constraints as a, um, you know, I began as a PhD student doing a fairly large ambitious project. Um, and it be the initial design be began as a sort of comparative case study between the two cities where I was testing a hypothesis from the literature, um, you know, kind of looking at differences and how differences in state capacity um, explain different outcomes in the two cities. Um, and then it changed during the course of my uh, research. And, and um, I built an ethnography as a method, um, use a kind of extended case study where your ethnographic research fits into kind of larger um, uh, theories and, and structural contexts. Um, and this, so I began my field work with um, six months of participant observation with this elite state business lobby that had catalyzed um, the Mumbai transformation project. Um, and, you know, that ethnography gives you, um, you know, you're sort of a fly on the wall to meetings and things, and you get to observe interactions um, amongst different state actors within the state. And it gives you certain, like, you know, um, perspectives and, um, ways of understanding that you wouldn't really get through interviews. Um, the, uh, then I did field work in Shanghai, and there is you know, not, I'm not going to talk about the comparative element here, but there is in my book. Um, but the once, you know, I'd spent some time in Mumbai, and you kind of quickly realize that governance doesn't just happen in these kind of formal institutionalized partnerships, um, you know, and spaces. Um, and there's a lot of like informal governance, governance happening outside the state. And I kind of like stepped out and, and started doing a kind of uh, a broader sort of multi-sided, broad rather than deep um, ethnography. And I also found that the existing literature didn't really explain or account for um, my observations or, uh, of how the city was actually governed. Um, so. Um, this, so this kind of broader, so this broader fieldwork or ethnography was in kind of multiple sites. I went back various times, lived in different spaces, um, and across various domains of state activity. And this concept really kind of um, emerges through this kind of accretion and agglomeration of um, ethnographic observation and detail, um, the kind of identification of common um, patterns uh, ac across different domains and sectors of state activity that kind of coalesce into this bigger picture of how governance works in the cities. Um, so what I'm presenting here, it's a kind of, um, uh, it's a middle range concept, or, um, and it's really looking at the, the city scale, which is an intermediate or meso scale. And, um, you know, urban research or studies of cities um, can be very interesting because they allow you to focus on this intermediate level where you can kind of you know, think about and it brings into view how macro and micro processes work together, how <coughs> practice and structure interact, how formal and informal workings of the state interact, um, you know, how an institutional and political logic works together. Um, so there's, you know, it's a, it's a good, it's an interesting scale for research. And a lot of research on urban India has focused much more on the micro scale. Um, and then I'm, I was able to kind of sort of sketch out a big picture account of urban governance across all these various sectors because I was able to benefit from um, the fact that there's been a lot of good, excellent, um, deep, in-depth field work in particular um, neighborhoods in, um, and domains of state activity. So there's you know, Hansen's excellent work. There's work on, um, on uh, water supply in Mumbai, on the production of slums on urban planning. Um, so, you know, so in addition, 
in addition to my own observations, I'm able to rely on the fact that there's a lot more ethnographic work, particularly on how um, the state operates at the ground level. Um, so there's, um, these are the, I won't delve into these in great detail, but these are the various literatures that I draw on. And um, there's a kind of, when you're doing field work with a view to generating theory, there's sort of this explicit and there's also a lot of implicit comparison which goes on, which is based on what you know from what you've read about how, um, about how urban governance works, how the state in India works, how the informal economy is organized. Um, and that kind of helps you think about, you know, it's very easy in India because there's so much going on to be kind of overwhelmed by the complexity. Uh, what, what's important, what's unusual, what is not explained by the literature, what's not accounted for in the literature. And the concept is kind of developed in, um, in dialogue, it's a, between your empirical observations and research and the kind of larger literature and, and body of concepts that you have within the social sciences. Um, so informality is structural and pervasive in Mumbai. This isn't some. This isn't a point I really have to um, belabor here. Um, and uh, as you can see from this picture, this is a. Um, an embroidery workshop in Dharavi, you know, it's, it's mechanized, it's um, not this like separate, it needs um, subsistence sector, backward technology or whatever. Um, it's not a waiting room. It is, as, as Barbara Harris White says, it's part of, it's very much part of the dynamic, actually existing real economy. Um, and, um, uh, again, as you see uh, that the formal and informal are heavily, imp are completely imbricated in Indian cities. It's hard to, on the ground, separate what's <laughs> formal and according to the rules and regulations and, and informal. Um, and um, while there, is, there are all these like, very deep interconnections, I'm going to focus here on the analytical distinctions between, uh, you know, what is formal and informal. But critical distinctions um, that they present to the state. Um, so um, informality, when we, you know, as we think about it today, it's not like this, it's not a separate sector, it's not the, solely the domain of street vendors um, or the poor or backward technology. Um, the way we understand it is that it's all various sorts of economic activities that are not regulated by the state's formal, um, or not, in, not don't conform to the state's formal regulatory and institutional structures. Um, and so the kind of, the contours of informality are fundamentally shaped by the state. Um, and this is something that scholars, um, you know, Marxist structural scholars like Portes and Brahman, as well as the neoliberal economists like De Soto would agree on. It's the kind of lines of state regulation that actually um, define the, size, the, scale, the, the state regulation, the state's um, ideology and its will and capacity for enforcement that, um, uh, that shapes the size and scale and scope of the informal economy and how the uh, state responds to it. Um, so widespread informality in Mumbai can be understood to be a mismatch between the state's formal regulatory and institutional structures and the organization of the urban political economy. And this match, mismatch has sort of grown over time as the informal economy has grown much larger and the kind of formal economy or the kind of formal factory sector has shrunk, manufacturing sector has shrunk. Um, so um, in Informality is, uh, as a lot of the literature has shown, it's useful for states which have um, a limited capacity to meet citizens' basic needs, a uh, limited capacity to enforce <coughs> rules and regulations. Um, it reduces costs for formal, formal firms. Um, and it also provides a state uh, scope to be flexible and adapt in times of rapid change and, and transition, uh, as is the case in India right now. So in some ways, it's not exactly surprising that India's informal economy has grown during this period of, of um, 
liberalization and urbanization. Um, and then again, there's a lot of literature, and you'll probably have your own daily experience of this if you read the newspaper. The state has a fairly inconsistent um, ways in which it responds to uh, what is informal. So it like alternately curbs, formalizes, ignores, tolerates, and accommodates. And, and sometimes, as say, um, Solly Benjamin and all have shown, it actively uh, collaborates in informal economic activities. And then you have these kind of periodic crackdowns and enforcement drives, which are not intended to, or um, you know, certainly don't have the effect of kind of uh, eliminating these practices, but are more a way of kind of demonstrating state power to maintain order and, and the rule of law. So um, when you have a city like Mumbai, where you have, say, the informal economy is whatever, um, 70, 80, 90 percent of the economy, uh, you know, clearly that, that, that all that or that whole realm of economic activity is not actually regulated, but it's regulated in various ways um, that we've kind of talked, of, uh, talked about in the last slide. Um, and the state needs to um, kind of, uh, and in this context, what I'm arguing here is that the state ends up adapting in order to govern this um, city where the you know possibly the majority of um, uh, uh, economic transactions, housing production, transformation in the built environment kind of happen outside its formal regulatory and institutional structures, and it needs to adapt because you know it needs to govern the city, it needs to maintain control, it needs to regulate. Um, it needs to very, you know, it needs to ensure that economic activities and transactions happen for political stability. It needs to extract resources and it needs to kind of tax and extract revenues. Those are the core state functions, right? Maintaining order um, and taxing and extracting revenues. It needs to service large uh, groups of people that do not necessarily have um, formal channels through which they can access land, housing, um, public services. Um, and so, so the state adapts, but this adaptation happens not primarily um, or largely through kind of centralized changes in rules and policies or reforms, not, and not, neither does it happen through um, kind of ground up democratic politics, mobilization, insurgence, resistance. There's not too much of that happening in Indian cities. Um, how it happens is through uh, these kind of accumulated, routinized practices uh, that I call jugar, which are um, kind of ways of adapting, improvising under constraints, solving problems as they come up in um, situations or in spaces that um, where the formal rules and institutions are circumscribed or, or don't really work. Um, So uh, yeah, so so I so I use the concept of uh, jugar, which um, is uh, it's so it's it's been popularized. It's now something that you know is used regularly in the Financial Times and things, and it's popularized largely by management gurus and things. So it's often an attribute of Indian businesses, firms, um, Indian citizens, and it's very often you know seen as this kind of. Uh, uh, a, a way of getting around uh, state deficiencies uh, and the rigid kind of bureaucratic rules and things. So the state in many, in some ways, is kind of the antithesis, this bureaucratic, rigid state is the, uh, you know, almost the antithesis of Jugar practices. Um, but you find actually that a lot of the ways in which the state governs its strategies and practices of governance could actually be described um, as something that is kind of an adaptive practice and a way of improvising or a way of working around rules and constraints. So um, the concept of the Jugar state, it's not just um, about these informal rules and practices um, 
uh, but also how they fit into the larger kind of structure and logic of this kind of form of bureaucratic state. And in Mumbai, you do very much have uh, a kind of uh, formalized a state with elements of a, a kind of Weberian rational legal bureaucracy. And when I'm talking about the state here, I'm talking about um, uh, the, the kind of state organization that has um, administrative control and power over the city. So it's the kind of uh, government of Maharashtra. Bureaucracy is the, the um, municipal administration. So Mumbai's municipal administration is, I think, the oldest continually governing structure in India. It's very formalized. You have pretty high levels of capacity. Their revenue extraction capacity, for instance, is very good. You have um, you know, professionals, professionals at the middle rungs. Um, you have this kind of extensive body of laws and regulations and standards and protocols and to kind of guide the state's activities. Um, and then you have um, a city that is in large part informal and um, is organized in, uh, so I think Hansen, Thomas Bloom Hansen has uh, this kind of uh, excellent account of the this kind of very um, networked, fluid uh, structures of governance in the city's popular neighborhoods or the informal spaces, uh, which kind of spiral in and out of state bureaucracy. So you have um, you have spaces where the state's uh, lower levels are kind of embedded in these kinds of um, localized informal power structures and networks. Um, that kind of govern Mumbai's popular neighborhoods or informal spaces or just large parts of the city. <coughs> now, in, so in the paper, I um, illustrate uh, state jugard in practice with an account. Um, I, I kind of focus on a, um, a kind of uh, an, an IAS officer, a member of the elite upper bureaucracy, because I'm trying to highlight here that uh, Jugard governance is not this dual system of governance, so you just have the lower reaches doing it, but it's something that kind of permeates the whole state in a city where so much is informal. Um, and um, so this, uh, you know, the, this is the, so the assistant municipal commissioner of the um, MMRDA is kind of a classic Weberian good bureaucrat who, um, till she was in this urban sector, uh, you know, saw herself as governing through the consistent application of rules. And she kind of described to me uh, how, uh, and, and she was in charge of, uh, of executing um, infrastructure projects un under the Mumbai Transformation Project. So, you know, in Mumbai, and that involves a lot of resettlement and rehabilitation of people. And she said that that's the most um, difficult and complex thing to do. So it's very complex. Each case is different, and it can take a long time. Politicians, corporations, corporators, local leaders, they're all there. Sometimes the engineers could resolve the issue. Sometimes I had to get involved. And you can't do it in a mechanical fashion. Say 70% is eligible, 30% not. So this eligibility uh, um, uh, that is related to the state establishing statutory cutoff dates. So, you know, that's kind of how states work. They need to create categories um, and, and, you know, clear rules that can be followed by everyone. And, um, you know, they have these cutoff dates in Mumbai, which kind of um, allow people who meet certain standards. Here it's people who have the paperwork to prove that um, uh, even if this paperwork is related to something that is officially informal, if they can prove that they... Um, have been occupying a structure since the cutoff date, they become eligible for uh, rehabilitation. Um, but you know, you can see from her quote that the um, the official, you know, realizes that this is a very blunt instrument to apply in any community uh, because people move; uh, they don't just stay in one house over time. There's a rental market which is not recognized by the state, um, so. Um, the, so she sort of ended up having this system, and it was both for expedience as well as fairness, where she created a class of um, informal project displacees who could prove they were in, in Mumbai, um, 
they had paperwork to show that, but they didn't live in the same structures. And then she kind of informally rehoused them, and they became unofficial tenants of the MMRDA. And then there were kind of other ways in which she um, engaged in practices that I categorize uh, as jugard, and that there were sort of improvised ways. One is how she um, uh, moved, shifted all these small shrines and crosses and, and little um, various religious structures that you have, which can be a flashpoint in Mumbai, you want to make sure. So she ended up categorizing them as well as project official, uh, project displaces, um, and um, uh, figuring out households that would host them, and then they, they got the um, rehabilitation benefits. Um, so, you know, you can see here that these, these are uh, um, kind of ad hoc improvised practices that, um, you know, change according to context, to expedience, um, and they end up over time um, giving the AMC and her engineers what James Scott called um, Matisse, which is like this kind of, um, a kind of adaptive uh, contextual way of knowing, which he put in opposition to the way that the formal bureaucratic state works, which is uh, through this, the logic of techni, which is um, standardized, universal, um, codified rules, which can be universally applied to various contexts. So you know, this is just one particular example. There's several others um, that I'll discuss in the book. I kind of argue that cutoff dates in themselves can be understood as a Jugar strategy, and that they're a kind of way uh, to kind of formally incorporate groups of people that have already been um, politically incorporated. There's uh, work on the regulation of street vending, these kind of informal licenses or potis that. Anjaria has written about various sorts of informal business activities. Um, there's a literature on the production, servicing, regularization of slums, um, informal and unauthorized constructions. Um, one of the interesting things is how um, the municipal administration collects taxes from unauthorized structures. And you know, this kind of really uh, illustrates the, uh, the ways in which different parts of the state might work, or its functions and different parts of the state might work against each other. It's in the municipal corporation's interest to um, tax all unauthorized structures because they are, you know, ultimately obliged to provide services one way or the other. Um, but when you have formal paperwork showing that you've been paying your taxes over years on encroached property, legal rights to that um, uh, get stronger. And the municipal corporation is not allowed to tax higher levels of the state. So again, it's sort of in its interest to also allow encroachment to happen, um, because it can't collect taxes from the um, state level or the central level. Um, and then, yeah, there's a lot of regard where it comes to kind of policing, surveillance, and social control. So that's where there are kind of bargains made with various sorts of, um, uh, you know, informal projects or practices. So this is kind of like a, an illegal park built on a pavement uh, by a local politician, which is, I mean, none of these are invisible. They're all clearly visible, but the um, government official was like, well, you know, if you want to enter those neighborhoods and maintain surveillance and things, you need to have a good relationship with these people, otherwise you can't enter. Um, uh, and uh, this is, um, and as I said before, so Jugar is not just something that is done by the state's trenches, though they may more often be in, engaged in these practices because you know, they're more directly interacting on a more regular basis with um, informal economic actors. And, um, uh, yeah, and, and, and at the higher levels of the state, you, there's obviously a lot more le leeway to formally make an exemption or to formally make a, a, a deal into a rule. Um, but again, this is something that permeates the state. And often, so the, the example of the municipal commissioner, the assistant municipal metropolitan commissioner, 
it's someone who's actually kind of intervening in that space and is kind of directly um, applying various kinds of Jugar strategies. Um, often the idea is much more kind of like ignoring or, or the, that the higher levels will do is kind of uh, ignore or tolerate uh, these practices. So this is a quote from another former municipal commissioner. It's like, plots get encroached, there's an involvement of politicians and officials, you have these illegal things, you have these undesirable transactions, and the matter is settled. All you're required to do is ignore it. The status keeps shifting. You manage to construct something and stay for a few years, get semi-authorized, tolerated, additional slums are brought under toleration. After all, an elected representative is expected to look after voters. And after 2000, they're not notified. So we're not obliged to give water and electricity, but it becomes necessary. Lower levels officials are involved, and it's something we can't stop, and that they don't want to stop necessarily. Um, So this sort of uh, headline is very common, these structures that get regularized or more legalized after the fact. Um, so uh, you know, these sorts of um, similar patterns of routinized practices that involve um, uh, negotiations, bargains, accommodations around the state. Um, Around, it should be around, around the state's framework of law, statute, rules, and standards and protocols that regulate how citizens and firms occupy and utilize space, conduct business, and access public resources and services. Um, that that's based, that's the, the, the core of Jugard governance. Uh, um, and you know, one of the essential elements of it is this mismatch between that kind of formal structure of rules and regulations and institutions and the ways in, in which people are actually earning their living and organizing their lives. Um, and um, what, regard, what these processes and practices of regularized negotiation, um, occasional collaboration, what it does is it embeds state actors, particularly at the <laughs> lower level, within informal power structures. Um, and there's a kind of informal delegation of power and authority within the state to lower levels um, and also to non-state actors. Um, and these processes of Jugard governance enable the state to maintain social control and oversight, extract revenue, satisfy popular demands that aren't met through formal channels, and avoid um, political, administrative, and financial costs that are associated with strict rule enforcement. Um, and this kind of it increases state society interpenetration. So, you know, the informal economy is technically outside the state. These processes kind of help, um, you know, bring them, bring it within the state. And over time, partially and unequally incorporates um, informal spaces within formal state institutions through the kind of, uh, you know, over time accretion of documentary evidence. It, it, interaction with the state, sometimes changes in formal rules and policies, like, like the cutoff date being um, updated long after the fact, usually, regularization. Um, and, uh, you know, as I highlighted before, this is something that's done by state actors at various levels that can ap apply these improvised contingent and politically negotiated practices. And um, I argue that these are neither strictly formal or informal, but jugard, as in that's the best, they, they can't be understood as one or the other because they're kind of based around formal state functions and rules. Um, and they, you know, they're not from some alternate set of institutional values or kind of like non-rational um, ways of thinking. Or, and, and these are also, I mean, there's definitely corruption and rent-seeking involved. Um, but that's, uh, you know, that I'm kind of bracketing that here because they're not merely corrupt or rent-seeking or clientelistic. And they're not the irrational acts of uh, kind of the vernacular low bureauc bureaucracy. Um, so this isn't a story like in Kaviraj where you have the kind of uh, rational, good IAS bureaucrats and the kind of irrational uh, lower bureaucrats. And, and so these are, you know, geared towards 
realizing essential state functions and objectives, um, and they're rationalized as such um, by the people who practice them. Um, under these various constraints of this kind of incongruous legal regulatory system and limited state power and capacity. Uh, so Jugar as um, a, a metaphor, the term, so, you know, I'm not, this is, um, uh, I'm, I'm not using it in the way the management gurus do to kind of celebrate uh, this kind of unique Indian characteristic, the similar uh, sorts of practices in countries all over the world, but um, the term is a, is, is a really great metaphor because it's both widely known, and that's what makes it useful uh, uh, to define a concept, but it's also an ambivalent and complex co concept. So you can see here, okay, you know, that vehicle, it's, it's bringing along a lot more people on a vehicle meant for two, um, but, you know, it's, it's clearly doesn't look very stable. It's probably not very safe. It could be, um, and there might be an element of innovation, but it, the, the term also encapsulates the, you know, the fact that it's usually this kind of makeshift ad hoc solution, it's responding to problems that are, as they come up, so it's not the most efficient way of going about things. Um, so yeah, as I, so as I said, the, the, the term captures a lot of uh, um, ambivalence and complexity, and also this way in which two incongruous things are fitted together. Um, so the kind of state structures. I talked earlier about practices, but um, the concept kind of works at two levels. It's not just about practices, but kind of the relationship between um, these sorts of practices being um, routine and, and widely applied, and the, how, how this the kind of larger state itself works. So, um, you know, the Jugar state in Mumbai sees itself partially and intermittently, lacking the God's eye view on which rational planning and administration is premised. So, uh, you know, the things, informal transactions, Jugar practices and things, they're, they're misrecorded, different, this is kind of very widely observed that different um, uh, state bureaucracies in different parts of the states have widely differing records. In Bombay, the state has no account of how much land it owns, let alone, you know, where it actually has control and occupies. So, um, you know, in a way, the more the city informalizes, the more irrational uh, its attempts to plan rationally become. Um, then the this horizontal embeddedness of state actors in local power structures um, ends up fragmenting the kind of centralized uh, and hierarchical authority structures that are kind of the basis of the power of centralized bureaucracies. That's how they make large-scale trans social transformations um, but through this kind of centralized bureaucratic st structure that's able to um, enforce their rules and policies throughout the society. Um, and what happens here is that there's this, you know, sometimes um, uh, the, these kind of hierarchical authority structures will yield to these horizontal networks and, and local politics. Um, so they, they kind of weaken organizational coherence um, and institutional knowledge. Um, so the, uh, the, the, the issue isn't so much that there are multiple state bureaucracies. That's quite common. That's normal. You have specialized bureaucracies, but they're all kind of in a way doing their own thing, and they don't have this common basis of, say, um, in, in terms of how they see the city, that their um, way, the data they have. Um, and and, and um, institutional knowledge also ends up um, inhering in particular individuals, so this long-standing clerk and things. And often they're at lower rungs, um, very low, uh, much lower rungs, and it's not getting filtered up. So they you sometimes will acquire disproportionate uh, power in terms of where they're placed in the hierarchy, um, and you have an informational asymmetry, and that kind of, again, attenuates uh, these um, kind of vertical power structures. So you'll have uh, a senior bureaucrat having to go to the clerk to find out how things work because there's nothing in the records. Um, and then these practices are normalized, but they're not the norm. Um, and that's very important because, uh, you know, ideologically uh, and legally, the formal rule-based um, 
institutional system is dominant and their internal and external uh, pushes for administrative discipline and rule enforcement. So this could be by the courts, it could be by these kinds of protests, by, by the governance activists or sort of moral minority that um, uh, see themselves as the, the, the rule followers. Um, in um, Bombay, so the kind of governance reform activities under the Mumbai Transformation Par Project, so that was a, a key uh, part of it, was to kind of uh, reform policies and rules and regulations to ben benefit corporate business and then actually be pretty strict about enforcing them. So again, no more chalta hai uh, or no more jugar uh, and discretionary politics, it's, um, no, di sorry, discretionary application of rules. Um, So just to kind of conclude and encapsulate uh, the Jugar state com concept, um, uh, the, the first thing is the context in which this sort of uh, a state might emerge. So given the size and scope of the informal economy, the accommodation and control of informal activities is a core task of governance, not a marginal process at the edges of the state. So, I mean, you'll have informal practices and processes in every state structure, including the most formal. So the first time I started um, studying or thinking about informal regulation was uh, studying street vendors in Harlem. Um, but it, it's, it's here, it's in a, this situation where you have this kind of mismatch between the state and its rules and institutions, and um, you know, this, the mass, the kind of very large realm of economic activity that's kind of existing, out, operating outside or on its margins. Um, and then the Jugar state is defined as much as, as much by the centralized insulated form of bureaucratic institutions and its modernizing ambitions as by its flexible negotiated and improvised governance practices. Um, the Jugar state concepts reframes these as more than corruption and clientelism while trying to capture the inherent tensions and contradictions that emerge within the state and the kind of disjunction between the state and society when, again, you have this large informal economy. Um, and then uh, the, the the Jugar state exerts power not by making the exception, but by selectively enforcing the rules. So the concept of the state of exception um, has been widely applied in India to explain the various exemptions and, and lack of rule enforcement. And um, one is like when everyone everywhere is making exceptions, what is not the state of exemption? And these are not, um, you know, when... Um, some mid-level engineer is, is approving uh, a plan that doesn't meet the state's requirements, that's not part of a larger project of future-proofing or anything. It's, you know, often just ad hoc. It could be pure corruption. It could be, you know, through political negotiation. Um, so it's not so much that it's... The, the, so, so the state exerts power in, in, in such a context by when it selectively enforces the rule. And that's partly why I suppose it doesn't change the rule, because it retains that ability to selectively enforce the rule. If it needs to, it can get rid of, um, say, people who don't meet the cutoff and things, and their, and their periods when it does. It can very selectively close particular kinds of businesses and things, again, as we've seen it doing. Um, Uh, and um, I'm going to conclude with uh, just, you know, some implications and questions that the concept raises. So, you know, this is a, the, the point of a concept is it's not to explain things, but to give a vocabulary to very widely observe practices, phenomena, and strategies that aren't really accounted for in the literature, and to raise kinds of questions and generate debates. So, um, you know, one is that, yeah, the, so the Jugar state, governs after a, fa after a fashion, but it lacks the ability to undertake long-term planning, and that might actually be important to meet citizens' demand. And, you know, the state resources and capacity to adapt and adjust are becoming more thinly stretched. Regularized rule violations undermine state legitimacy, and they may undermine a public health, safety, environmental um, objectives. So, you know, some regulations don't make sense, many of them do. Um, 
it's particularly when you're thinking of things like fire safety, environmental regulations, and things. Um, uh, you know, another implication is if there's amongst the kind of good governance uh, activists and things, it's sort of axiomatic that uh, adherence to rules is what constitutes good governance. Um, you know, that's something that needs to be uh, questioned. So, uh, uh, or the depoliticization of state policy. So, you know. Um, it's not that the situation is unfair, is fair as it is, but it might make poor people even worse off if these kinds of various informal channels through which they um, access the state are cut off um, and have influence on state policy. Um, other questions it raises is, you know, does the Jugar state ability to incorporate informal groups preclude broad-based political mobilization and resistance? Because we don't really have much of that in India. Um, then when, where are these strategies tolerated and formalized? When are they curbed or actively uh, uh, restricted? And then finally, is Jugaad an enduring feature of urban governance in India? Or, you know, is it something that with the state's push for formalization and corporatization, so things like the GST and things which are bringing um, informal businesses under the tax net, um, the new real estate regulatory acts and things, and the new surveillance technologies, which, you know, makes m everything much more uh, visible to the state. Are they going to reshape the state's relationship with the informal city? So does, then does, it doesn't really matter if something is informal or not. Um, and then finally, to conclude, why do we need new concepts and theorizations? Um, so we, um, urbanization in India is kind of one of the most kind of profound social, political, economic transformations happening. And it's happening in ways that are very different from uh, how it happened in the past and, and the kind of context in which most of our theoretical frameworks for these processes were generated. And, um, you know, there's still large gaps, not just empirical research, but in theoretical research. And um, what often tends to happen is that empirical findings get shoehorned into various existing concepts. So uh, one of the things we were talking about is actually existing neoliberalism, um, where the actually existing part gets, you know, that's ignored and gets left out. And that might be actually much more interesting than the neoliberalism. And then you're not able to kind of accumulate knowledge because uh, if, if uh, what you know, there's, there, there ends up being this large body of work on, say, neoliberalism, and there's this actually existing, and there's a lot of other stuff that's happening that we're not really accounting for, explaining in the literature. And then when people go out and do empirical work, the, again, the kind of concepts and ideas, and particularly debates between concepts, um, is really what kind of shapes your interpretation of what you observe and what you think is important. Um, and then there's, while there's been a lot of um, call for theorizing from the South, there still hasn't been that much of it. And then you know, theorizing from the South doesn't really need to remain in the South. Like what's going to happen in cities? First of all, that you know, it's a, most of the world's population is going to live in cities of the South. It can no longer be this particularly marginal category. Second. I don't quite know whether China or Eastern European are cons or Europe are considered part of the South, but there's a whole lot of variation within the South itself. So we need way more complex understandings that are both rooted in particularities, but also speak to our larger, you know, body of social scientific knowledge and, and concepts. Um, so you know, there's a I think there's a real scope and a need to generate uh, new vocabularies, concepts um, like. Um, Chimamanda uh, Gizi said, we shouldn't have one story, we shouldn't have one theory or one or two theories. We need many more theories, we need competing ideas um, and debates that are grounded in, in, in kind of empirical observation and reality. Um, all right, thank you very much.